My name is Kyle Kusinose. I'm the director of the Jones Institute. And um, we are starting our 2024 teaching season um, next weekend um, with the fascial counter screening for the adipose system. Um, but what we wanted to do here today was sort of zoom out a little bit and kind of come back because we're starting the new year to um, to our intro class and, and our, our fascial foundations courses uh, next month in, in March, March 15th through 17th. Um, and we wanted to talk to the prospective student or to the practitioner who's looking for more um, and um, present this as an option for something that uh, that might really help them in their clinic and in their practice. Um, so I'm here with Brian Tucky. Uh, he's the developer of fascial counter strain out in uh, Frederick, Maryland. Um, and um, I'm going to be picking his brain today and uh, trying to help both myself and all of us um, understand more about this technique and uh, and really the body. Um, I've learned so much about the human body through this curriculum um, because of, of Brian's work and Brian's research. Um, Brian, anything else you want to say to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm, again, Brian Tucky, the developer of fascial counter strain. Uh, I've had about 35 years of experience in the manual therapy field. Um, I'm one of the original four physical therapists that was certified by the originator of strain and counter strain, which fascial counter strain is based on, uh, before he died, Larry Jones, in the late 1990s. And I have a very eclectic uh, manual therapy background prior to really uh, deciding to go 100% in the direction of indirect and into this technique. So uh, I can give you a perspective that's, you know, multi-system, different types of manipulation. And it's really based on, uh, you know, years of experience clinically and then fascial and pain science uh, combined. So we'll get into what makes this technique different and then, you know, really give you an idea of what it can do for your uh, caseload and your professional uh, career in general. So I guess if we just start out with the basics here, Brian, what is fascial counter strain? So basically it's a innovative form of manipulation that allows us to address multiple different types of tissues, not just the musculoskeletal system. So yes, the technique addresses all parts of the musculoskeletal system. We can work on fibrocartilage and myofascia and capsules and ligaments, et cetera. But it also works on the viscera. It works on the entire vascular system. And it also works on the entire nervous system, uh, somatics, autonomics, you know, and even cranial nerves, dura, et cetera. So it really expands the, the power and scope of uh, physical therapy or osteopathy, whatever your profession is. Are there, I guess, before we get into like the nitty gritty of the, of the science here, um, like, are there like really good case examples that you could show us and prospective students? Um, yeah, that's a, it's, that's a great place to start. So just to give you guys a little bit of perspective of uh, how it can, uh, you know, change a case rapidly, even a failed case. So uh, in the foundations of fascial counter strain course, the first class, we actually go through a series of, you know, six or so uh, different case study videos, live treatments, just to show the, the audience the power and the scope of the technique. So we'll quickly show you two of those, um, just so we can kind of refer back to, to some of the changes that you can see even in a very uh, failed chronic case. So the first one I'll, I'll connect and share to you guys is a, a, a patient who had a four to five year history of chronic back pain four different surgeries, uh, subsequent rehab with, with no improvement. Then he did finally see a fascial counter strain practitioner who's now one of our teaching assistants uh, at the time she wasn't. And um, she worked on several different systems and found actually the viscera to be his greatest area of restriction. When she met this uh, gentleman, he was on a walker and he had you know made some insignificant gains. So once she had reached uh, you know her max benefit with him, you know, he said, you know, hey, this was the best thing I've had and where'd you learn it? And she said, you know, if you're willing to travel, you can go see, uh, you know, Mr. Tucky's. And so he came up to see me. And what you'll see is that entire visit uh, from beginning to, to end, um, minus the treatment, just the before and after and the reassessments. And you can see what this five-year failed case, uh, how he walked in and how he leaves. Okay. So let's go ahead and share that real quick. And we'll share... There we go. All right. So hopefully the audio is running and you guys can watch this video here. This morning has had multiple surgeries in his back. As 
had quite a bit of counterstrain uh, performed. Uh, the viscera is clear, several other systems are clear, but he is a pretty strong musculo ligamentous uh, pattern, and we're going to see how poor his motion is in flexion and strength. Okay, so go ahead, Ben, spend forward to your fill tightness. And if you round your back there, you start down pain, everything. Okay, so you can see that's not quite where you want to be. One more time, again, which, what do you have comfortably? Okay, and you feel that through the back, hamstrings, everywhere? Yes. Okay, all right. And go ahead and lay your back there. We'll check the straight leg raise. And then we just check the straight leg raise. He looks, he has about 45 degrees. He's already wincing there. Right about there? Yeah. Okay, maybe actually it's about 30 degrees. Up straight leg raise. And the other side. Right there. Okay, all right. And so you have, you've had laminectomies at a one, two, three, four, and five. Two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. One's the only one left. One's left, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So it's about 25 minutes later, and what we found were anterior longitudinal ligament dysfunctions in the lumbar spine, posterior longitudinal ligament uh, dysfunctions, and some pretty severe lower extremity muscle chains uh, all the way down into the ankles. And then we're going to reassess his straight leg raise and trunk motion. So you tell me when, Vince, if you have any, any pain. We're going to bring it up again. Still good? Yep. Okay. And yeah, right about there. There. Okay. Definitely better? Mm hmm. Okay. All right. Good. I'll come back down. So that was about 30. Then we were about 80. And then the other side was a little better, about 40. And we're going to bring this up. Now we're still free. Okay. All the way up to 90. Yep. All right. Excellent. How long has it been since you had that kind of motion? Can't remember. Can't remember. So before the first surgery, probably. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see how your trunk motion is. When was the last time you could bend all the way over? Can't remember. Can't remember. Okay. Well, let's see what you can do. How you feel? Good. Good. No pain. Nope. And so just a little hamstring, maybe. Mm -hmm. All right. Put your hands down. See how far you can go. So. Wow. So that was even more than I thought it was going to be. All right. I'll stand. Okay. Okay, we're six weeks later back with uh, Vincent after his last treatment. Um, he reports maintaining all the motion improvement and has returned for one little spot on his right iliac crest. Uh, we're just going to show you a pre-treatment uh, range of motion uh, test to show that the gains were maintained. So go ahead uh, and bend forward for me. And there he goes. And let's see, can you touch the ground for us? All the way down to the fingertips. Excellent. And come back. And what did you feel there? Nothing. Nothing. Good. So, all right. Great. Thank you. So let's get back here. Stop sharing here. So yeah, we'll, we'll go through one more in a second, but let's talk a little bit about that particular video. So that was essentially a musculoskeletal example, but uh, you can see the, the change in adversarial tension of the straight leg raise, the cytic pathway, uh, you know, it was done with ligamentous decompression, which opens up the foramen where the nerves exit and gave him that motion back. It, so that was really a ligamentous technique, but you saw the change in, in nerve tension. And the key thing was when he came in and that six week later follow up, that was his second visit. So, you know, that one half hour session, uh, you know, resolved that and maintained that particular uh, disorder, going to call it that, um, for the entire six weeks. So, Brian, that that patient, five years of chronic pain, probably even more, right? So they had back pain. They probably had some sort of form of, of traditional care, failed, needed multi-level laminectomy, yep. and then went into rehab after that. And each then time. each time and, standard, and standard failed. Rehab. Yeah. And failed that. And then had a multi, some multi-system work, but then when, when finally got to you was a, a almost a purely musculoskeletal patient with the spinal ligaments being the main source of dysfunction at the time. Explain how, like with all the other musculoskeletal paradigms that this patient likely received, musculoskeletal treatments, how were those ligaments missed or not impacted at all with all those other things that fascial counterstream was able to target so specifically and, and release? So it gets into the, the difference between direct and indirect manipulation. And 
for the people in the audience who aren't uh, aware of what an indirect technique is, it really, they originated in the osteopathic field and they are really going in the direction opposite of most manipulation. So typically we will engage a barrier, you know, we'll mobilize a joint in the direction of restriction. Uh, we'll try, you know, feel an adhesion, try and break through it, uh, you know, stretch a joint, passive range of motion, et cetera. Those are all direct. Indirect, you decompress the tissue, you deactivate the pain receptors called nociceptors, and you also create a negative pressure in the area which drains inflammation. So we're gonna get into a bit more of the science behind the technique, but suffice to say, it's, it's actually completely in the opposite direction. It's completely painless. Um, it is something that has outstanding carryover because it gets to the, the inflammatory root of chronic pain. And it also is able to address tissues at any depth. So, you know, we can decompress the thoracic cage, the cranium, we can, you know, unload things in the spinal canal um, it, it really allows a, a depth of treatment and a carryover that is really not achievable with direct techniques. And so why, you know, isn't it being done? Um, mainly because people have to wrap their mind around the new paradigm that, you know, everything is just not an adhesion that you can break through by taking things through the elastic range and the plastic range and breaking it. And, um, you know, there are plenty of of studies now that show that you know the deeper fascia can't that you can't do that like TFL things like that, so it's a completely reflexive, inflammatory based treatment, and it is getting to the root. That's why the carryover and the outcomes are so uh, significant. And for for my patients, I always like to to simplify it for them and give them a, a real world example. I give them just the the stuck zipper when you're zipping up your suitcase, right? You're as you're trying to zip it up, you're coming up against a restriction. You can either try and yank through it or pull through it, which is oftentimes aggressive, painful, um, or you can go backwards, right? You go backwards, you allow things to line up, you move the clothes out of the way, and then you can proceed forward again. And so that's really what we're doing with, with counter strain and in going indirect. Um, so that was- and, and I, I would say that, you know, the first part of your question was how did uh, previous therapies not address that particular yeah. dysfunction? And- what Christine saw in the first round, having talked to her, were actually non-musculoskeletal barriers and restrictions that would have been in the way of even addressing those. So she found all types of uh, nociceptor activity coming from the vascular system and, and the viscera. Um, you know, so that musculoskeletal layer was actually underneath, and anybody who works in manual therapy understands the concepts of, of layers of dysfunction. And of sure. course, that that exists in the indirect world as well. So uh, I think what we can do next is to to show you kind of the complete flip side of the world, where we're looking at a non-pain example, uh, something that has nothing to do with the musculoskeletal world as far as the impairment, and you know the pain is caused by uh, impairment of the lymphatic system, and show how the technique can you can switch and see the opposite case. This is a non-musculoskeletal case. And so we pull out that part of the curriculum, address the vascular system, again, get very quick resolution. Um, whereas in the previous case, we did pull out our, our musculoskeletal skill set. Okay, so I'll jump on one of those real quick and then we'll talk more about the technique. So let's go back in. So we're gonna go and let's throw it here. Okay. Let me hit it. I need to. I need to share there real quick, sorry. Okay, all right, so this is, this is a case of a uh, lady who fell and had a fracture right here in her upper humerus um, in 2010. And the fracture was not significant to the point where she ended up going to the ER, had it diagnosed and was put in a sling and swap, um, but she ended up having severe swelling and pain. And this particular uh, picture is taken by her husband nine days post-fracture. So anyone who works in the lymphatic and venous system or has taken some lymphatic therapy, MLD type training, you can see this is the right upper extremity lymphatic watershed. It's really a classic you know, presentation of that. And What's going on here is that this particular uh, lady's lymphatic system has gone into a state of vasospasm. It's dysfunctional and it's unable to drain. 
So she showed up to one of the fascial counter strain practitioners and he happens to now be also one of our instructors. And, and Tim shot me this picture and said, would you treat this lady? And I shot him back a text and said, uh, did she have a Doppler? And he said, yes, yeah, she had a Doppler. So her Doppler was negative. So it was no clot. She was just in, by her estimation, 11 out of 10 pain, nine days post. Okay. So Tim went in and he assessed her and she, of course, had a very strong, uh, you know, uh, positive diagnosis for venous and lymphatic dysfunction, treated that plus a few other things. And he managed to get all the way down and treated out the lymphatics and venous structures of the elbow before running out of time. The next picture is about, you know, two days or less later. Um, and again, you'll see what the body was able to do with the vasospasm having been removed with fascial counterstrain compared to what the first nine days her body was able to accomplish. And there she is 48 hours later. Again, the husband took this picture and, you know, almost a complete resolution of, of you know, all of the edema, um, even some of the, you know, obviously the clotting, the lymphatic system, once it was working, you know, really was, really was able to resolve this the way it should have in first place. And you can also see where the treatment was stopped. So these distal lymphatics in the radial and ulnar area wrist were not cleared. So again, there was some remaining stasis. So this is a, a patient, once again, if you tried to take a musculoskeletal approach to this patient, um, it would be very, very difficult because this was not, it was actually a vascular primary patient. Yeah, I, I imagine the patient walks into a traditional PT clinic and probably receives you know, some combination of, of some very gentle exercise um, with maybe some very gentle massage. But like you said, she was in, what was the number that she gave out? Of, she said 11 out of 10. 11 out of 10 pain. So none of that's going to gonna go very well. Um, I, I guess, you know, try, talk to us about the, the shortcomings of the musculoskeletal paradigm. Um, because you know, I, I teach um, at, in a PT school, in a, a physical therapy program. And certainly the curriculum is centered around, you know, everything being musculoskeletal. Um, the at fault tissue is, is always a musculoskeletal tissue, right? If it's a muscle and it's tight, stretch it. If a muscle, it's weak, strengthen it. If it's a joint capsule and it's tight, mobilize it. But, but it never really considers the other tissues within the body as being tissues that, you know, can drive uh, dysfunction can drive inflammation and therefore protective reflexes that restrict all of the objective things that we as PTs assess in our evals and, and re-evals. Um, so, you know, why is the musculoskeletal par paradigm not enough? Yeah, it really is a, an, an archaic paradigm. And unfortunately, again, it's still emphasized in, in many curriculums, but to look at the musculoskeletal system and to say that the pain receptors are only in those tissues, you know, we now know, and we've known for many years, that's not true. So there are nociceptors or, or pain, you know, recepting, uh, uh, you know, fibers and that take those messages back to the spinal cord in virtually every soft tissue in the body. So yes, it, they're in the, the myofascia and the ligaments and the capsule, but they're also in the tunica adventitia of every vessel. It's also in the ligaments that anchor our viscera to our thoracic cage, abdominal wall, all the visceral ligaments, um, all the mesentery, the, the nerves, okay, the neural fascia, the epineurium has nociceptors, the dura, the meninges, it's all, again, nociceptive tissues. So even looking at the musculoskeletal system as simply myofascia is, is a very, very old paradigm. You know, you have to look at all of the musculoskeletal system. And then the question, and what, what this curriculum will really teach you is, when a nociceptor is activated, again, chronically, and we'll talk about how inflammation is the source there, um, what happens next? Okay, yes, you reduce pain, but, but how could you account for what you just saw? How could you account for that severe uh, vasoconstriction? And we'll go through the, the research, you know, it's, it's no longer theory, that when the nociceptors are fired continuously, then, they send messages into the spinal cord and do two really key things. Number one, all nociceptors will go into the ventral horn and stimulate muscle guarding reflexes. So you'll see muscle guarding. So for example, if, if I strain my brachial plexus, the upper trapezius will often contract and I'll walk around with this elevated shoulder. The upper trapezius is unloading and protecting that brachial plexus. 
So the problem is neural tissue, but you see a muscle guarding reflex. And you know all tissues have this to some extent. So many times practitioners are trained to feel the muscles. Oh, your rhomboids, you know, oh, look at your, your hamstrings. That gentleman with the straight leg raise, his hamstrings, you know, became quite tight, as you can see at about 30, 30, 40 degrees. But it was really the nerve root that was being impinged in that foramen because of the narrowed ligamentous, uh, you know, the dysfunction of the ligaments. So again, muscle guarding reflexes, you see muscle tension, you can't then say, oh, the muscle is the cause. You can't say that. Can a muscle guard itself? Yes. But every single nociceptor and every single system has the ability to call in a muscle guarding reflex. You, you bruise your kidney, your quadratus lumborum will go into spasm. You know, you get problems in the, in the spine, you know, your, your psoas, your abdominals can guard. So that's one thing. Number two, pain receptors also go into the intermediate lateral column, the autonomic area of the cord, and cause autonomic irritation. Basically, sympathetic nerve activation is what these pain receptors do. And SNA, as it's called, you know, in the research, does many things, but one is it causes regional vasoconstriction. So you'll get spasm of the veins, the arteries, and it can cause impairment of the lymphatic system as well. So basically you'll get vascular, you know, uh, outcomes from these inflamed tissues, all tissues, and muscle guarding reflexes, loss of range of motion. So, so again, it, it's a very complex system with multiple proprioceptors and spinal cord reflexes involved. And to say, it's just in this little trigger point and I'm going to stick my thumb in it. Um, it's really a very old paradigm. With that said though, these are patients that are, they're multi-system patients, but they're coming into the clinic um, with complaints like neck pain, mm -hmm. mid-scapular pain, shoulder pain, thoracic pain, uh, lumbar pain, right? Um, they're not coming in with complaints that are like vascular related or, or neural related per se. Um, they, they may, but if, what typically happens is someone who has, for example, lower back pain will also have some associated spinal cord related visceral complaints. They may have irritable bowel. They may have a neurogenic bladder. And when the average therapist, if they're stuck in that musculoskeletal pure paradigm, they're just ignoring this, right? They're like, oh, that's not related. Oh, that's not related. But it is related. If, if you look at L1, for example, L1-2, you know, the, the conus medullaris, the end of the spinal cord is right there. So if you get inflammation at that segment, it'll irritate all the neurons that come out of there and they innervate every single organ below that constipation, you know, neurogenic bladder, uh, you know, menstrual cramping, all these, uh, you know, other systems are involved and those nociceptors could be feeding into it or they could be secondary to spinal cord inflammation. But, you know, most of these people, they just travel doctor to doctor to doctor with these multi-system complaints the doctors roll out pathology and they're like, you know what? I scoped your bladder. It's okay. I, I scoped your esophagus. You're fine, but they're not fine. You know, they still have the symptoms and it, it's the world of dysfunction versus the world of disease. And what we will teach you to be are dysfunction experts, right? We leave the pathology to the doctors, but when they're like, I don't know why it's not working. Cause you look fine to me on MRI. We'll tell you why it's not working. Yeah. And that, that world of dysfunction, it lives right in between on a spectrum. It lives right in between normal, optimal function and then pathology. And right now, you know, the medical system, as long as you're not pathological, you're normal. Correct. Um, Correct. And, and that's, that's where the world of dysfunction lives is right there. And, and you've talked to functional medicine doctors, for example, I have lots of you know colleagues and friends in, the, in that world, and they're just starting to, you know, it's a concept that seems like, duh, but they're just starting to look at blood work and say, hey, well, maybe when you're in the upper end of normal, maybe you're treatable but dysfunctional, right? So using the idea of, of kidney. So kidney is one of those organs that is very impacted by sympathetic activation, one of that whole loop I was just talking about. And you can get you know, vasoconstriction in the area of the kidneys. You can overwork your kidneys with the sympathetic activation. And you can start to see your creatinine levels, you know, going up and up and up. And if there's vasoconstriction, a lack of blood flow to the kidney, the kidney is slowly being starved to death and it and its function starts to deteriorate. If you can get in there and treat that by fixing the blood supply, you know, before that tissue dies, it just goes right back. It, it's the 
proverbial green wilting plant that you water, okay? On the flip side, you give us somebody who the kidney is completely died, we can then treat that area, but it's too late. But so you want to catch these things in the dysfunctional state. And actually it starts to show up in the blood work when it's quite curable before it's fully diseased. So let's talk just real quickly about, you know, another like headaches and and migraines. So, you know, we're talking about this anatomical model of of treatment. Um, Like what would be, you know, a few things that a, a musco a, a therapist with a musculoskeletal uh, musculoskeletal paradigm uh, would miss that we find with astral countering a few dysfunctions. So, so first, we'd have to get into the conversation. You know, is it really a migraine, right? Because you know, vascular headaches, uh, if they're on the arterial side, related to this this sympathetic activation, hundred percent of migraine. Um, but then there are the whole world of of lymphatic you know, glymphatic system and venous pressure headaches. And, you know, those are not technically migraines. They don't respond well to migraine medication. But if, if it truly is a migraine, then, you know, we can target, first of all, the uh, large neural, uh, you know, pathways from T1, T2, and your, you know, superior and middle and even inferior cervical ganglia uh, that innervate the vessels that go into the head. And that vasoconstriction uh, can create you know, obviously havoc in the brain. And then you also have your spinal trigeminal complex, which is impacted by, you know, C1, C2, C3, which also can affect basal tone in the, in the brain. So we're able to, you know, target the neurovascular dysfunction, you know, that controls the vessels, you know, that are in the brain. So uh, yes, we, there are cranial techniques. We do treat the cranium directly, but so much of that can be done doing the sympathetics that start at T1, 2 and then the cervical pathways that lead into the trigeminal complex. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things I love about this technique is you know, teaching anatomy and, and doing anatomy dissection, and then teaching neuroanatomy um, at the PT school level. You know, I, I teach my students all of these structures, um, and without trying to overwhelm them with you know the specialty, you know, postgraduate technique that, that I use in the clinic. Um, I wish I could just give them all the context around like why we're studying these structures. Um, yes, you can treat them, you can impact their their function, um, but I kind of have to like hold back um, a little bit in doing that and just, you know, cause right now they're just learning the anatomy for the first time. Um, but I love how, and I know other people that have been through PT school or, or medical school, like they've learned these structures, they've learned the preganglionic, postganglionic pathways, they've learned the, um, CSF drainage pathways. They've, you know, learned even like getting down into a, you know, a simpler orthopedic case like the knee. They've learned about the geniculars, um, but they've never thought about them since since that anatomy class, right? Um, so this technique really bringing bringing us back to anatomy. That you know you have this doctorate level knowledge of anatomy, and then really just a simple, you know, physiologic understanding of the body, um, and understanding that these these structures can become dysfunctional. Um, and when they do, their function is impaired. Um, yeah, and- I think, I think if, if I was listening to this feed right now as a, you know, 22 year old, when I first started practicing, you know, I would be saying, treat, 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 you know, what are you guys doing differently? Because, you know, I, I couldn't have done that for that back patient with mobs and stretching and, I wouldn't have known what to have done with the lady, you know, an 11 out of 10 pain with that kind of swelling. Um, So what makes it different? You know, how does this, you know, physiologically work? And, you know, let's just say that the opening lecture is an an hour and a half of intense fizz. So we're not going to try and talk about that in the feed. But just briefly, um, you have to realize the entire, you know, curriculum is based on identifying and releasing trapped inflammation in the interstitial space. So nociceptors that fire, pain receptors that fire ongoing, something must be triggering them in an ongoing basis because the tissue would heal, the lymphatic system under normal circumstances can just get rid of the inflammation. You know, somebody punches me in the arm, I'm like, oh, but then it fades away. I'm not in chronic pain. So uh, several world-renowned, you know, pain scientists, researcher, uh, and I in 2020, 2021 published an article 
on how inflammation trapped in the lymphatic system can actually be the driver of dysfunction in all these systems. So um, it is something that is, is kind of a paradigm related to the fascial science that I've been aware of for 20 some years. And it was just very recently that enough of the you know, research came out that we could, you know, get it published in a, in a major journal. And so again, it's identifying areas of trapped inflammation, using diagnostic tender points and several other processes that we teach you. Then you decompress the involved tissue and drain the swelling out. And we use a, a surface diagnostic tender point to know when we drained it. And that's the diagnostic tender point. So um, we'll, we'll, there's a link to the article. I'll bring it up here real quick again to show you guys. But that this article is kind of the, the leading uh, peripheral pain article right now because the other ones have been disproven. Um, and it basically goes into how inflammation can get trapped, how through these reflex arcs it can affect every system. And, you know, again, uh, muscle guarding, you know, the sympathetic activation and, you know, of course, chronic pain. So, so it, it's, a, it's a process that allows us to diagnose and remove inflammation from the body when it's trapped, which is what's driving the process. And if you go in and create pain, you know, you go digging on it and stretching it, you're fighting these reflexes and you may create more inflammation. And, you know, many people, they'll, they'll uh, come to me and, you know, they'll relate to having seen many, many practitioners. A lady I saw today with a, you know, six page printout of what was wrong with her. Um, I said, so for all these conditions, what have you tried? And her answer is because I've tried everything. I've been everywhere. I've seen everybody. Um, she's like, if you want me to go through it, I will, but I'd rather you just assess me and start working. And so she goes, it's all in there. I'm like, okay, fair enough. Uh, so, and, and I'll say, which one of those things helped? And she'll say, you know, none of them long-term, some right. of them a little bit, but some of them made me worse. Yeah. And when, you, when you're going at a tissue, you know, essentially the wrong direction because you've been told to do that. You know, you're like, well, I should be able to blast through this but not realizing it's a protective reflex. And then you may create more inflammation instead of actually diagnosing it and alleviating it. So you can take a person in the wrong direction. Right. Yeah. Um, so actually I'll, I'll bring it up real quick here. Yeah. Uh, and just so we can see this article. Yeah, so this, this is the article. It was uh, published in Frontiers of Musculoskeletal Pain in August of 2021, and you can see it talks about impaired lymphatic drainage, uh, novel mechanism, and you know this is a you know a major peer-reviewed journal. Um, and this particular article, if you were to bring it up, go into the musculoskeletal pain section, and look for uh, you know most viewed and most downloaded all-time article. It actually is the the most downloaded article. So uh, it is a uh, you know been gotten a lot of a press in the research world. And then I'll show you one more thing here. So then uh, we, we talk about in the courses, where is the inflammation trapped? Well, you know, these are really uh, pre-lymphatic channels that using CLE, kind of focal laser endomicroscopy, um, you know, back in like 2018, researchers have now found these, these kind of sheaths of pre-lymphatic channels that surround all the vessels, all the nerves, all the myofascia. And that is where the inflammation is trapped. And then again, we talk extensively about uh, a whole cytokine cascade and how it eventually produces a, a, a cytokine called TGF beta one, which makes fascia contract and it blocks the drainage of these pre lymphatic channels. So, this cytokine exposure you know, causes a blockage of the drainage. We identify that and then we decompress the tissue and we drain it out. And so, we have this little diagram where we'll go in and we'll call, put a little stretch on the lymphatic on one side, which makes it kind of pump faster. And we create a negative pressure or a vacuum, which draws in the inflammation deep in that tissue. And we maintain this kind of, uh, you know, draining position until all the muscle guarding and all the tenderness disappears. And it's getting to the root of this inflammatory stasis, which is described in the article. The root system. And, and I think, you know, you kind of you said it real quick there, but the fact that they found this interstitium, these interstitial spaces in every system of the body, right? Um, that's what really allows us to target and treat every system, right? And then, you know, it, it tells you how you could have chronic visceral pain or vascular pain. And people, when I say chronic visceral pain, 
you know, they're saying, oh, well, my patients don't come in and say, my heart hurts, my lung hurts, my mm -hmm. belly hurts. They may occasionally. But it turns out the other, one other really key concept um, that we'll go through in the courses is the concept of, of nerve convergence and inflammation sharing in the spinal cord. So it turns out that that the viscera, you know, has its own unique pain pathways, but there's also this convergence of the of the neurons to where most visceral things get perceived as musculoskeletal pain. So a sacroiliac joint, very common viscera, you know, pseudo sciatica is very common. Uh, mediocapular pain, the rhomboid, you know, very common, commonly pleura. So you see all types of visceral patients and visceral nociceptors are very strong, um, but they don't respond to popping and, and muscle work because those things, the joint things are all secondary. You have to be engaging and draining the tissue, which is the viscera. Um, uh, I want to try, I want to try and talk kind of maybe directly to some of the, the people that are on the feed here. Um, Kind of via via their profession. So um, we've seen over the last oh, five, six, seven years definitely a, an influx of massage therapists into the curriculum. Um, and massage therapists come from from varying different backgrounds. So in your experience teaching massage therapists, um, which ones like which ones have been have shown to um, you know ha have a knack for this technique or or to be ready for the the advanced physiology, the uh, advanced manual skills. Um, you know, which, which massage service is going to be most appropriate for, for this curriculum? Yeah, th this is not a curriculum for the spa relaxation, you know, minded practitioner. You know, this is for uh, the massage therapist that, you know, treats pain, wants to know where the pain is coming from, um, really has a clientele that's coming in and complaining of things that they want corrected, not just like if I'm, a, if I'm, you know, at an all inclusive and, you know, I may have a beer and go get a massage for relaxation, you know, that that's not our target audience. So um, if you're a massage therapist out there and you massage the people today um, and and you felt areas of hypertonicity and, and you know, palpable muscle guarding around a certain spinal segment, for example, um, and you massaged it, you know, you know, as well as I know, when you see them two weeks from now, they're going to have that same knot, you know, to some extent. Um, and it's because again, in the cases where it, they come back and many of these do with massage, it's because that muscle guarding is a surface muscle guard. It is not the source. So if you're somebody who's like, okay, I'm fine, you know, working with that over and over again. But if the other person says, I'd like to know what that's coming from, what can I address to get rid of that, to make that permanent change, that, that would be somebody that would really enjoy the curriculum. Then for... For physical therapists, I mean, you're a physical therapist, I'm a physical therapist. It, it certainly has seemed to be sort of our bread and butter with our, our student um, student population. Um, uh, I would say a, a large percentage of our highest level students are physical therapists, and they really seem to be uh, perfect for this technique in a lot of ways, um, but one of them being uh, the work environment, right? You're seeing one to two patients an hour, you're seeing you know, 16 patients a day, and it's an environment that really facilitates getting uh, skill acquisition and getting really good at this technique fast. Um, but for someone who's like a staff physical therapist working at a clinic right now, like what's motivating them to, uh, to take this, this leap to entering into a, a challenging cricket. Yeah. I mean, I, I think anybody who's been in the trenches and, and um, despite developing the courses and teaching internationally and doing research now um, I've never stopped doing it, you know, and uh you know, so 35 years, you know, every day, uh, you know, in the clinic and, you know, no one wants to see that person on your schedule who you don't know what's wrong with them. And, you know, when they come in, they're going to tell you they still got still have that pain and they may have flared up and they may have gone backwards and, you know, you're out of tricks. So, number one, just, you know, satisfaction and really having things to try and, and understanding pathophysiology and chronic pain and fascial science and lymphatic science will open up the world of diagnosis for you. So you, you'll have, you know, every class you take, you'll have 60 to 80 brand new techniques in a system you've never treated that you can go right back at your caseload and say, all right, now I've got lymphatic skills. Now I have arterial skills. Now I have nervous system skills. Let me take a look at that again. And so uh, it's it's a, a growth, you know, that a professional growth that is just uh, continues. And, you know, that's one thing. Number two, you know, if you're in that, you know, high volume 
you know, uh, kind of, you know, have a trail, you know, going over the, in the, in the, the wheel there. Um, you don't have time to diagnose. You almost, you know, just end up doing protocols and, and throwing exercises at people. Fascial counterstrain practitioners, and you and I talked about this one day, and we estimate 60 to 70 percent are cash. Yeah. And they're doing it an hour at least per session. And people are coming and paying, you know, a very, very, uh, you know, a, a nice rate. And you're and you're getting into what's wrong with them. You're diagnosing it and you're fixing it. And they're sending people to those people because they're actually getting relief that lasts. And um, so if you want to get out of that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, 16 patients per hour protocol world, um, we'll give you the skills that will allow you to do that if it's a goal. We've seen that time over time with with our student base where, uh, you know, students transition from being, you know, in network, in the grind, the outpatient grind, and then uh, you're working 40 plus hours a week and, and going, um, transitioning into a cash-based model where they maybe see 20 patients a week, you know, 20 hours of patient a week versus 40. Um, and while doing that also increase the revenue that they generate. Um, it, I, I think, you know, talking to a, a lot of uh, PT students, the, the, the goal of, of being a business owner and starting their own practice, um, it, it is super common. Um, so for, for someone who owns their own business now, or for someone who intends to own their own business in the future, um, do you feel like this technique can help them in that endeavor or? Yeah, you know, so uh, I guess the simplest way to say this is that your patients, because of the unique nature of this technique, the fact that it doesn't cause pain, the fact that they feel, you know, you identify tissues and talk in a, in a, in a way that no one else has prior and really go right into the problem. Um, they're going to leave there after, you know, a few sessions and they'll mark it for you. Right. You know, how many times have you had the patient uh, before they left the eval to say, do you treat this and do you treat that as well? And then we're like, yep, because it's a multi-system full body paradigm, you know, so your scope expands. So, so, um, you know, like I'll spend a lot of my days and, and, and not even treat pain anymore. You know, you know, uh, working on POTS, working on dysautonomia. A, a lady came in yesterday from, from New York, uh, chronic cough, nine years. You know, that was her only symptom. Um, so, you know, they'll, they'll just start asking, well, my husband's got that. Can, can he schedule with you? And I mean, so they're, they're just marketing for you. And um, you don't have to run around to, you know, offices and buy secretaries cookies and all, all these things. And because right. you're doing the same thing as everyone else. So, so I, I was never that much of a business person. You know, I'm not a marketer. I'm not a salesperson. Um, so I prefer my patients to market for me. And, and it's always, it's always kept it. It's always worked. Right. The um, one, one, I think amazing thing that we've seen over the last couple of years is uh, this um, interest from, from DOs and MDs. And it's sort of like they're coming back into this osteopathic manual medicine paradigm. Um, and speak to that a little bit and really why is this curriculum really perfect for what DOs who still value osteopathic manual medicine? Um, why is it, it perfect for them? So the first thing I would say, you know, not to in any way disparage the, the older osteopathic techniques, but, but in all those clinicians defense, the science hadn't caught up to the human hand. Right. Okay. So, it, so it was very hard, number one, to have a structured, scientifically based anatomical paradigm and you know support it with science all the way which helps you keep it on track in the development that's what this is right um but you know looking just even 20 years ago when i first started talking about the fact that fascia is a proprioceptive organ fascia is contractile and everyone looked at me like you know i was crazy even though it was you know there was already some research out there but i had been treating it for many years and Fast forward now, if you go to PubMed and put in fascia, you'll get 23,000 articles. Okay, so from your wacko to 23,000 articles in the last 15, 20 years. So, um, you know, there's so much science behind it now. And so, and we can give you, you know, the anatomical correlation to these tender points. So, so Dr. Jones's strain, counter strain technique, you know, he didn't have the science. So he was like the anterior thoracic five tender point and, you know, in the lateral trochanter. Now there's an anatomical correlate. So, so if you want to 
address a dysfunctional organ, it's an anatomical model. So let's check the person whose kidney, like I used before example, let's check the renal artery. Let's check the renal vein. Let's check the pre and post ganglionic sympathetics from T10 to L1, which go to those vessels. Let's check the renal fascia. Let's check the, the T12, L1 segments, musculoskeletal because of convergence. And the ureter and bladder, we can check all those connected areas, um, which then allows us to, to really you know, take a condition pull out our bag of tricks multi-system and correct the anatomy to almost any condition. If they come in with an eye condition, you know, we can check the ophthalmic vein, the ophthalmic artery, the cranial nerves, the extraocular muscles, the cranial bones of the, you know, superior and inferior orbital fissures that those nerves cut through. Um, you know, all these structures are in the curriculum. So you just address the eye. And how many times in my career have I had a patient say, have you ever treated X? And I've never heard of it. And then I'll just type it in and they'll say, idiopathic condition of blank. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but it's an unknown, so send them in. And sure enough, you target the anatomy and they're like, oh my God, it works. So that's the beauty of it, it's an anatomical model. So any doctor could use this. Um, if, if they wanna get back into manual medicine, and like I said, start to look at the blood work and say, you know what, your, your, your blood sugar levels you know, are starting to elevate a little bit. Have you done anything in your diet? You know, they say, really, I haven't changed my diet. Okay, well, let's look at the entire endocrine system. Let's look at look at the pancreas. Let's look at the segments that could change the blood flow to that organ. Because So you would have to do musculoskeletal. That's the point. Yeah. yeah, so it's giving us the opportunity to to move beyond the musculoskeletal, to be move beyond pain complaints, and, and to actually be medical, um, which is you know where a, a lot of our training is, even in in the doctor physical uh, doctor physical therapy programs now. Yeah, and, and we're not you know. We work in conjunction with MDs. Um, right. You know, they diagnose pathology. They'll use their their tools, which may be you know medication or surgery. Um, but this is a very unique you know modality that does something that is very unique. For, for example, when you look at the idea of trapped inflammation in the interstitial space, okay, first it's in the interstitium. So anybody who's on the doesn't know what that means. It's the clear fluid in the body. It's the lymph fluid. That's where the inflammation is trapped. It's the blister fluid when you get a blister. It's not in the bloodstream. In a very small amount of, you know, things in the bloodstream diffuse into that space. But everything that's picked up has to go back in the lymphatic system. But this is an area of stasis in the clear fluid. So anything you take as a drug, it's got a decent amount in the bloodstream. It does diffuse to some extent, but it's not going to diffuse in a high concentration into an area of stasis in the clear fluid. So that's why so many medications you know, don't have a permanency or a curative effect to this type of dysfunction. So we, we have a very unique place in medicine, uh, degenerative changes, people who have a knee that degenerates, right? 15, 20 years later after an MCL tear or an ACL tear. Well, what happened was they had that dysfunction. They had that vasoconstriction that sets up, you know, they get a little bit of their motion back, but they never really get it totally resolved. Now they have chronic sympathetic activation and vasospasm in that knee which starts to starve that knee and it, it prematurely degenerates. So when they're 55, their old football knee is the one that became arthritic. It's not a random event. It's a mm -hmm. lack of blood supply driven by dysfunction that no one ever treated. Right. right. Um, <clears throat> I do want to just start to wrap up here. Um, thank you guys for, for being with us. Um, but I wanted to give Brian the opportunity here at the end, just to kind of summarize the overall advantages of, of the technique. Yes, yeah, so I would say, uh, first of all, multi-system. Number two, getting to the source of the, of the chronic uh, reflex arcs that are in the body, which is trapped inflammation. Uh, number three, you know, depth of action. We can work at any depth, you know, all the way into the, the spinal cord. In advanced classes, there are central nervous system, entire classes, where we're treating central sensitization, inflammation in the cord, brainstem, and brain. Um, painless. Okay, that yeah, can't be understated there. This, it does not hurt. You can do it in elderly. You can do it in infants. You can do it in people in chronic pain. Um, and then again, just the, this, the scope of it, it takes it outside of the world of pain so that people come in with, you know, tinnitus and, and, and vertigo and peripheral neuropathies and uh, IBS, uh, you know, visual disturbances. You've got techniques that you can pull out and you can assess that anatomy. So you're not just saying, well, you know, I'm really only good at knees. <laughs> we'll have to forget everything else you just told me. Um, when you when you get through the top part of the curriculum, you know, you have a, 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 a tool that allows you to assess for dysfunction, 
you know, virtually all those systems. So your scope is immense. And as a reminder, the uh, the entry to this curriculum is via the Fascial Foundations course. And we're going to be teaching that for the first time this year uh, on on in March, on uh, March 15th through the 17th. And, you know, if you liked what we talked about today, what, what Brian educated us on, um, then, you know, we would certainly hope to see you guys in that course. Uh, we hope to put out more content like this um, to continue edu educating you guys. Um, and so uh, either in a course or next time on Facebook Live, um, we'd love to have you guys back. Yeah, and I know with Frederick, I think is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is sold out, but we're having uh, other satellites and then we're also doing it again in August, correct? Uh, the beginner class. Really, yep, again in August. Yeah, okay. uh, for yep. March, Frederick, Frederick sold out, but we do have spots available in, in other locations still. Okay. Yeah, so then once, you know, again, it's uh, something if you if you come into the first class, we'll, we'll, what we teach you are 40 different techniques in five different systems. We teach you the basics of the assessment uh, and of course, go through the fizz and everything so you understand why it works. And but you'll leave with uh, with you know lymphatic skills and arterial skills and visceral skills and treating you know spinal ligaments uh, after the first class. And those techniques, they're going to be applicable for patients Monday, right? Right. Like as soon as you get back into the curriculum or into the clinic, you're going to yeah, have it, patients that need it, those it, techniques. There's a lot of skills that we teach. You know, there's some hand skills you need, and you need to understand what you're doing in a pathophysiological sense um, and the assessment, you know, there's, there's some feel to this. So it's really a, you know, the more manual training you have, the easier it is to absorb. Um, but again, you know, we, we've trained people that are, uh, uh, you know, how many people do you yes. know, like that you've treated that going back after the, receiving the work, they're like, okay, I'm doing this. And yeah. they accountants. And, <laughs> you know, I, uh, one of the guys who, who just went back in our area, he he plays George Washington. <laughs> He's George Washington when you go to the um, uh, down in, in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. You know. He He's, he's George Washington. And uh, that's what he's done all his life is play George Washington. He's like, nope, I'm a counter trainer. So he, he just went to, he, uh, went to massage school and he's taken foundations class. Yeah. So he's like, See, all, yeah, all he's people. like, he's like, this worked on me. Nothing else did. And I want to do this. So we, we just got George Washington. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you, Brian. And, uh, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, and we'll see you guys next time. Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.